Hey gang, I'm Nikila Croce and today I'm sharing the mic with Edward Miskey and Edward is an actor, singer, songwriter, producer, and most recently the author of his recently published memoir, Cancer, Musical Theater, and Other Chronic Illnesses. And Edward is celebrating his 10-year cancer-free anniversary of a rare aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And through sharing his story, Edward's seeking to bring to light the truth about what happens to your life during and after cancer treatment, ranging from relationships to career, your wants, needs, and all of the transformation that happens in between. This is a long-awaited conversation. Welcome to the show, Edward. Thank you. I know we've been like at this for six months or something trying to make this happen. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. Like so much time has passed that we're actually kind of past the 10-year anniversary and we're like, we're like career reening into 11 like i think it's 11 That's years great. in three in, in three days in three days it's 11 years oh my god <laughs> what has even happened in the last year how did I we how did we end Jesus. up so far from our first conversation <laughs> i don't know <laughs> life just happened and we it kept found ourselves back here again honestly yes. life is life and life is lifing and it's just you know, I listen, I love a TikTok. You know this about me. I am on TikTok all day, every day. It's my favorite source of information. But as much as I do love it, I really think that there are certain corners of it that are starting to rot my brain um, and make me not want to do anything because it's like watching these Gen Z kids just like be fed up and walk out of their jobs. Like, love that. Oh my God, it brings me so much joy to watch. I love and Gen Z. I feel like they're doing I something that I wish so we had I'm so excited for them. Me too. I'm so excited for them because they have, like, I'm, I'm sure you hear a lot of this in the online space too, where it's like, you're in control of your life and you get to decide what happens to you and blah, blah. And we're really good at saying that and parroting that. But like Gen Z is really good at doing it because oh, they're perfect. like, you're right. I am in control and I hate this job and I hate you. You're a terrible manager. And I'm walking out the door because what are you going to do once I'm gone? Literally nothing. Like I, I have that in me. I have that little bit of Gen Z in me, but yes. I've never activated it until yes. I've started watching these kids on TikTok. Uh, isn't it so <laughs> cool like, though? To it's be amazing. I, it's my favorite thing. I love it because I like being in an older generation that can look at the younger generation and admire them for that. Whereas I feel like yeah. so much of it historically is condemnation of the younger younger generations for not doing it the same way. And I'm like, no, do it differently because whatever the fuck we're doing isn't working out. And what I right. think has afforded them that opportunity, my wife and I talk about this all the time, is that like Gen X and millennials have really become those cycle breaking generations. And so it's like by breaking the cycle, we're not necessarily going to immediately take the action, but they're like the upholders of the cycle breaking. They're like, oh, okay. So you gave us the runway and now we're going to take it. And I'm like, yes, do that. And by the way, can I catch up? Like, can I get on that runway too? Right. Take, <laughs> take me with you, please. <laughs> on your private jet that you're probably funding with your TikTok salary. <laughs> right. For real. But I mean, but I mean, thinking about it too, like you know, we we were all mostly raised by boomers, right? Yep. Like my, both my parents, both my parents are boomers, like millennials for the most part are all raised by boomers. And so like what worked for them is is no longer relevant. You know, like my parents, I think they bought their first house for under $100,000 and mm -hmm. they sold it 20 years ago for like almost three times that, you know, and like that that world doesn't really exist anymore. And, you know, like my I was at home and my little sister and my mom were talking about like 401ks and I was just sitting there chuckling to myself <laughs> like oh that's that's cute yeah, um that's love, novel. That, love that concept um <laughs> how arcane but um you know it, it's just um I think we've we've grown up seeing that through Gen X and boomers of like that whole go to work you save money you do the things you try to stay out of debt blah blah blah, blah. and we try to do that with with unprecedented upsets along the way at every single turn that did nothing but push us down and push us down and push us down and make us more quote unquote far behind than we sh quote unquote should be again you know like all hypothetical scenarios uh as compared to generations before us and so like us watching gen z watch us and acting accordingly being like i'm not doing that I'm not going to be almost 40 and in debt with no savings or anything. Fuck that. Why am I even bothering? Right. And, and the why am I even bothering thing is kind of the other thing that I feel is rotting my brain because there are definitely like, there's this one girl I follow. She's great. She can't be older than 25. And she's just like, 
like she went into a job, hated it, walked out and left. And she like a really high like marketing level job. Um, and after nine months, she was like, I'm done. I hate it here. I don't want to do this for the rest of my life because this is the end game. Absolutely not. And right. so she left and now she's like, I get by barely by doing menial jobs that I don't really care about. And I spend the rest of my time having fun. And I'm just like, oh. God, I wish I had that in me. <laughs> well, I, I think yeah. it's in there somewhere. <laughs> well, I feel like it is in there in the sense that like it's about resilience and and understanding that what we believe, as you said, should be, quote unquote, isn't necessarily a what is or even what we want. And I feel like to tie it into just your overall perspective and your story, it's like you you mentioned as millennials just being handed these really fucked up circumstances. I mean, I graduated in 2008. I must've said it a thousand times on here where it's like, I basically was handed my diploma and the economy tanked. And I'm like, I have a film degree and a mountain of student debt. I couldn't get on my parents' health insurance because that wasn't a thing. So I was like, the only reason I went into tech was because I knew that I needed a job because if I needed health insurance. And my thought wasn't like, oh, I know that I need health insurance because something's going to happen. It was if heaven forbid something happens and I don't have that, I'm going to be even more in debt than I already am. And the economy shit. And I spend more money than I'm making just to get to and from work each day. Like, what is the point in what I'm doing? And and why am I even, you know, putting so much energy into this? And it's like, we had to kind of stare into the face of these moments in time that we're going to need to be re-architected to fit a new world and the way that like technology took over the way that d- emotional intelligence is coming to the root of so many of the conversations and things like that. And so I imagine being in a place where you receive this really difficult diagnosis, it's like you're, you're kind of in one of those positions at like a very personal level where you're like, everything is exploding. Like, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Is that like sort of, what was that like for you? Well, I mean, it's it's so funny hearing uh, different people's perspectives on the 2008 crash, because when I was in the thick of all that, I had just moved to New York, right? Like I skipped college. I was like, fuck this shit. And I moved to New York and I had an apartment that my parents helped me get into. And then I went out into the workforce. And, I, I, and also, I've had a job since I was 15 years old. Like I got a work permit and I was like, no, this school bullshit is bullshit. I want a job to make, like pay me, pay me for my time. And uh, so I moved to New York. I got a job. I had a hard time getting a job for the first couple months that I was there, but finally landed one after a bit and made it work. But I went from, I didn't want to be one of those like actors that's a bartender wait tables. Like I wanted to be different. So like I went and got administrative jobs. So I worked front desk reception and then I ended up getting a job at a hedge fund as an executive assistant. And I was there when the crash happened. And so like it like finance the worst place to be <laughs> during that whole period of time <laughs> um but what really worked for me was getting laid off of that job because mm. i got a 4 month severance package full pay full benefits and so then i was like well here's my window i'm jumping out of it to go and be a performer full time and if there are two things that people do not lay up like let up on during recessions it's the beauty industry and entertainment those are two things that will always and forever do well during bad times taylor swift beyonce hello um like (laughs) we're like we will spend our money on this because it's keeping me sane it's keeping me sane exactly it's like i look good and i feel good and nothing else matters if the bill collectors are calling it doesn't matter who (laughs) um that i feel like that was kind of that's kind of like the mentality there but anyway so i i spent the next 15 years from that point forward, being a full-time actor for the most part. But up until the point where cancer happened, which was 2011, at end of 2011, I had done a string of shows. I was so busy. I had worked back-to-back for nearly two straight years. And I had some momentum going that felt like things were about to, like, get me to the next place. And then all of this medical shit 
completely derailed me. So it was very much like, and I'm not saying like I was financially stable or secure or whatever, but I went from being able to functionally being able to pay my bills, doing what I wanted to do in the first place Mm -hmm. to like credit nose diving, credit cards calling me all the time because I wasn't allowed to work. I couldn't work. And I was in the hospital full time. And it was just like, well, (laughs) this is different. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's a, it's like a complete paradigm shift. Like you don't have what it, you have no life experience. I guess, thankfully up in that, until that point, you didn't have the experience to know how to handle it, but then also then you don't have the experience to know how to handle it. And it's not just even knowing how to, it's the fact that you're in a position where this isn't like you've lost your job and now you have to re-navigate things. This is your life is at risk. Your health is, is failing and you don't necessarily know what a path forward looks like. What is it like to be confronted with that? Well, I mean, first of all, it's kind of all of those things, right? Like, it is your job has gone away. It is every every single part of your identity has gone away. And also, it's not like you can just go out and apply for a new one or find a recruiter and get a job that way. You're just not allowed to work. Like, everything is on pause, stopped. I had like artistic directors calling me and casting directors calling me to ask me if I was available for certain things and they wanted to hire me for certain things. And I'm literally sitting there attached to a chemo pump being like, I'm, I can, I'm sorry. (laughs) And their assumption was that I was already booked and like, we're so sorry to bother you. Like, so like that felt really shitty. And it, it was both of those things where everything is gone and there is no path forward because you just have to exist in this one singular moment. Mm-hmm. And it really is like the hardest lesson in taking things one day at a time, um, which I'm terrible at. Absolutely terrible at. Never have Same. been good at it, even during or even during this period of time. <laughs> like, um, you know, sitting in a hospital bed, getting to the next hour to make sure that everything was OK, to make it to your next appointment, to get your next medication, whatever it was. I was always thinking 25 steps ahead and that doesn't really work when you are locked in a hospital room. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That, that just goes out the window. How long were you Um, in the hospital for, for your treatments? Front to back, it was 10 months, but I didn't like live, I didn't like live there Mm -hmm. per se, but like I would check in and I'd be there for two weeks or I'd check in and I'd be there for 10 days or like, you know, whatever it was. Cause my, my chemotherapy regimen was multiple days of the same drug on the same bag. And so like, I'd be on one bag for 10 hours. I'd be on another bag for eight hours. And like, there was just no way that I would be able to go home and like, just hang up this bag of chemo on the wall and be like, cool, I'm going to go to bed now. Like, <laughs> And you were, <laughs> like were you living by be... yourself at this point too? No, no, I had a roommate at the time, okay. um, which is kind of sad and funny how that happened too, because I was on the road all the time. I didn't really have an apartment. I'd given my apartment up at the end of 2010 and I was just like hopping around to sublets and this friend of mine was like, hey, you can leave your stuff at my apartment. And I was like, cool, I'll just pay you a monthly rate. Like you're a storage unit or something. It was a very expensive storage unit. Um, but I was like, just leave my stuff here. And if I come back, if I need to stay here for a couple of days or a week or two or whatever, like that's fine. And that's what ended up happening, except for I came back and had to stay. Wow. And so it was this very unplanned, hi, I'm moving in with you. Is that okay? I am dying. <laughs> And so, of course, he wasn't going to say no. And and he and I are still friends to this day. But, like, you know, the room I was staying in was, like, you know, six by ten, six by nine. It was very small. And Mm -hmm. so my entire universe just shrank. Not only because I couldn't have the job, I couldn't have any momentum going forward. There was no path forward. There was no future that I could see. It was just me in the hospital and this tiny little bedroom. How do you maintain some sense of optimism or hope when what you're feeling is that there's no future in sight because I feel like that's how so many of us manage through those moments of difficulty. I mean, I feel like a lot of us feel that way right now, medical aside, you know, it's like, how do we move forward from, from place that we're standing at now as a society, as a political democracy, as an economy, like whatever, like whatever the thing is, it's like, how the fuck do we move forward? I don't see a way forward. Um, And to be honest with you, if it weren't for my family and my my friends, 
that would have been a much worse situation. I was very fortunate to have a lot of support coming at me from all directions, from family and friends. Um, they were the best. And I'm still friends and in touch with most of those people to this day. I love that um, you said and that. If I, because sorry to interject, which, but which I, part? <laughs> no, I, no, the, that, <laughs> so something that I've been just driving towards with the, from the onset of this show, but especially in the last little while, I've been thinking about how part of what I really care about doing as a result of this show is helping people create stronger support systems, because there's so much right now happening in the world where um, I mean, I just read the Surgeon General's report on the loneliness epidemic and how, I mean, first of all, just the health impacts of that, but also from a, a societal perspective, it's like we need each other and we've come to a place of so much divide or come to a place of so much divide that I think a lot of people forget how much we need each other. And so when you mention how critical your support system is in going through those moments, the hardest moments of your life, or at least some of them, I feel the exact same way. I mean, that's how I got through the simultaneous loss of my mom at the same time I left an abusive relationship that was still in the middle of the pandemic. It's like, if I was only me in those moments and I didn't have that support, like I can't even fathom what it would have looked like to be on the other side of it. Well, I mean, I think that that comes down to, of course, and of course this is different for everyone, but I feel like self-medication, you know, like I was self-medicating with alcohol throughout treatment, you know, like it was <laughs> the chemo and bourbon cocktail um, and it wasn't good and I shouldn't have been doing it. It was terribly unhealthy and it was dangerous to be doing that in the first place. But like it was, everything was a huge spiral. And yes, I had support in all directions, but that doesn't mean every single day was like kumbaya everything's fine oh yeah no it, it, sure. it very much was not <laughs> you know yeah, like, well, it's almost like that's knowing... the thing that stops you from even going further down the rabbit hole because i would i would like chain smoke joints while i spent three hours on facetime with my best friend being like i'm fucking gonna lose my shit like i can't handle my life right now you know so i understand yeah. it's it's the um it's the recognition that that plays a pivotal role in even if you're hitting rock bottom at least you know that there's somebody who has a hand to help try to pull you out of it well and if i can comment on like the loneliness epidemic um i think that first of all that is solely and mostly completely to blame social media you know like social media is the reason why we're so wrapped up in our phones and not into the relationships around us like i even see friends of mine who are very very good at this who monetize everything and like good for you but their entire life is on camera and it's like every you can't spend 10 seconds with them without them whipping out a camera and being like oh my god we're doing this that, and the next and like that's their job and that's what they do and somehow i have found myself in that in that vortex of being a part of your job and yet i'm not being paid for it but it's it's very much like I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. And this feels weird. And so if we're going to go under the assumption that people are doing that en masse in some capacity because of the demand for content on social media, because of the demand for visibility for people who own their own businesses, mm -hmm. then of course it's isolating. That's a hard job to do that and really do it is really time consuming. For sure. And unless you have enough money that you can throw at people to do editing for you or put piece things together for you. Like it is a, it is a multiple full-time job. I am living and, proof of that. And that is why, <laughs> and that is why I struggle with my social media presence because I feel like this conversation right now is what I want and care about doing. And the clips that need to come out of it to create the visibility to compete with other people who are doing something similar or reaching an audience that I want to reach. It's like, I know I need to do that because that's how you generate the value in terms of growth. But for me, it's so the antithesis of what I'm trying to do in helping people connect. It's like, how do you, sh how do you find the rhythm of that without, as you said, sort of swallowing yourself whole with like your presence constantly needing to be on camera, constantly needing to put something out there and, and losing sight of what's really in front of you in that moment. Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, having having recently exited coaching world, which I find now from a farther away removed vantage point to be so toxic and terrible. Um, it's just and I won't even get into it, but it's it's so daunting looking back at like how and why did I even find myself in that situation? But I feel like in that kind of sphere, the online 
entrepreneur kind of world, there's so much demand to just be churning out content at all times because of algorithm and visibility and converting and, and, you know, audience and growth and attraction and blah, 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 blah. And you don't really need to do that. You know, like, yeah, if you want to jerk the algorithm off, like by all means, go for it. Are you going to get to a million followers faster if you post five to seven times a day on certain platforms? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But like, I always think of this um, interview with Matt Damon that I saw where he was on Graham Norton and he and Graham Norton says to him, like, you know, you were so young when you won the Oscar for Goodwill Hunting. And he was like, and thank God I learned that night how much it didn't matter. And I don't know, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know if those were his, his exact words, but, but he basically he won and his girlfriend at the time wanted to go home afterwards. They didn't want to stay for the after party. So they went back home and he, he was like, I put the, she went to bed and I put the the trophy on the thing. And I just kind of looked at it and was like, this is it. He was like, I, he was like, I immediately just thought of like some 80 year old man who like spent his entire life chasing this thing and finally got it. And then it was like, this is terrible. And I've seen other interviews where people are like, everyone I know who has one of those things, they get it and they go home and they cry because they realize how much it doesn't matter. And they've spent their whole lives re like chasing that. And like, I know, and like in the moment, of course, it's emotional. Like, oh my God, you've won this accolade and it's wonderful. But like the next day when the dust settles, that's kind of what they're talking about. Yeah. And so I kind of point that same kind of mindset towards content creation where you isolate yourself to the point where you're churning out all this content and maybe you hit a million followers and you know what's going to happen when you hit a million followers. The same thing that happened the day before and the day before that and the day before that and the day before that. So like I don't focus on metrics at all with social media. I work on, I focus on like narrative and strategy and working smarter, not harder. <laughs> I mean, that's it, hear. right? It, it's, it's, and that's it's, different for everybody. But yeah. like, I don't, I don't post on TikTok five times a day. I barely post on that post on TikTok five times a month. And yeah. I still have a great following and my audience is still engaged with me because of the content that I'm creating. But I do not and will not make that kind of content catalog. It's just to me, not worth the time. So when you think about the engagement with your audience and, and think about how that resonates with you and what you're creating what do you feel is most important for you in creating that content like what is it that drives you to connect with people through that whether it's content creation on tiktok or it's something else that you're doing writing your book doing something on stage like what is it that drives you i think from um more of a purpose perspective uh my purpose as far as social media is concerned at this point has just come down to do I feel like posting today and and if I do what do I want what do I feel like posting about so it's really coming from a place of like what what am I feeling in the moment sort of yeah I mean and and I think a, a lot of what these online entrepreneur people get in themselves in the way of is that they think that they have to show up online as a particular thing or because they're an entrepreneur that that's all that they can talk about because in you know millennials in the mid mid 2010 aughts or whatever you want to call them kind of made the word influencer a dirty word but really like that's what the fuck you're doing you're an influencer so like mm -hmm. either make content like one or just be like i'm gonna be you know the home shopping network and you can watch me do a commercial for every single fucking video and nobody wants that so like get over the whole influencer thing and just be like hi i'm a person and if you want to learn more about me there's a link here and maybe sometimes i'll talk about it but like today i'm eating ice cream and like laying around with my cat and i'm going to probably watch something on max later hbo rip but like, you know, it's it's just it's this whole like, I'm a business person and I need to go be a business person on on social media. And it's like playing the part of being a business person. Yes. And like that is the first thing that is going to get in the way of making you be relatable, interesting, authentic and all that other bullshit. I just I just can't with it anymore because I I now can see it so clearly anytime like TikTok for me used to be like I'd stop on every video and watch it and my I think my algorithm has changed a little bit too but I'm just like three seconds and I'm getting rid of these motherfuckers like I don't I don't care what you're saying like none of you are interesting where did the people I like to follow go <laughs> where are they it's interesting that you said that too because I do feel like so much of what's happening is 
when you're slave to the algorithm, you're putting content out there that might not even be what you want to put out there, but you're trying to engage in a way that you're trying to be someone else. Yeah. You're trying to fit the mold. Right. You're trying to play the part of a business person. Like, oh, I'm a business person. And this entrepreneur person over here told me to do this. So I'm going to go do that. And it's like, ugh, everyone is so bored. Please stop everyone. (laughs) So what is it that lights you up when you think about where you want to go? If you didn't, if you're kind of eliminating that feeling of I have to deliver this type of content to get these metrics, et cetera, like put that all to the side and say like, okay, I have been through some shit. I've seen some shit. I have felt a lot of it. Like, what is it that you feel is driving you at this point forward, regardless of what the medium with on which you're doing it is? Um, because you, you are, as you said, a performer, you are a, an author, you have such a variety of skills um, in the artistic field, but you're also speaking very intelligently about just sort of the broader societal impact of these things as well. Well, and I think it's because of having a, a long career in entertainment that I understand the broader impact of this because I've been doing it since I was a child, yeah. you know, and like I could see my friends when I was like 10 years old going off and playing while I had like rehearsal for something or like, you know, when I was 16, all my friends were going, I mean, at this isn't a great example, but they were all like going off to get high somewhere. And I was like, oh, I can't. I'm recording an album. Like, yeah. I, I, I can't be like, I'm busy. And there was always a greater good for myself. And I think I let a lot of that kind of get lost um, post cancer. I think getting cancer shook me up a lot. And I mean, obviously, <laughs> and, <Did it? laughs> uh, you know, coming, <laughs> no, it's easy. It's such a breeze. <laughs> Let's go again. Oh, um, but like, it was, yeah, knock wood. No, no, thank you. But um, it maybe just one little maintenance chemo for some weight loss. But, you know, um, it it just was like, I I kind of like had all my pieces shaken up. And so when the dice were tossed again and they hit the table, it was like, I, I don't know what these numbers are. Yeah. And then it took me a couple more years to really kind of get my bearing. So like, to answer your question, like what lights me up? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I have a lot of things that I want to do. What makes me happy right now is that my book was published. I had a really great press campaign around it that's still going. You know, I really love doing these podcasts. I think they're so fun, you know, like, especially when I meet people like you who are really fabulous and fun. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But then also I'm in the middle of, um, you know, my two friends and and now co-producers are going to be making this pushing this book to be adapted for television. Oh, that's cool. And we are working on all of the things to make that happen. And it's why I wrote the book in the first place, because I always saw it as like a musical TV show. And that's what we're doing. And You're so speaking to like my that, soul, I love a good musical. <laughs> same. And so like that's that right now is what lights me up. But I also love talking to people about like what we're talking about now. Like you don't have to like do what all these other fucking like talking heads online are telling you to do. Like you can do it a different way. There are other ways to do this. It's again, just being smarter about it. So that you're, you don't feel like you have to like create 70 hours of content every day to make things happen. Yes. I have seen that work for people and they have gotten opportunities out of that and they have been paid for the work that they're doing. Yes. It can totally work. However, I too have gotten brand deals and press and other things because of the content that I put out. And I am not doing that. I am not working that hard. Right. And so it's like, about staying so, true to so like what me, you... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I think you were about to say exactly what I was going to say. It's, 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 it's what I feel like doing and what keeps me happy. Yeah. It's not that I'm not willing to do things that won't make me happy or things that won't make me uncomfortable because obviously we always have to do things that we don't want to do. But at the end of the day, after I've done those things, I'm only going to do what's going to make me happy. Yeah. Well, because it's also driving towards the result that you want. I think a lot of times the things that we do that make us unhappy or maybe aren't what we specifically desire in a moment, it's with the intention of getting somewhere else with that. Like exactly. even just having discussions with my wife the last couple of weeks, I'm like, I want 
this to be able to be my thing. I want to be able to have conversations with people. I want to sit in a studio across from people. I don't need an audience or or anything, but I just want to be able to be one of those people that has a show and they sit there and they talk for two hours about shit that's important and enlightening and connective. And I feel like when I'm doing that, I understand why I'm here. And when I'm being sort of pigeonholed into like, get this content out, figure out how to cut it into 60 seconds and make it impactful, use the right captions, use the right technique, do this, do that. It's like you, you just whittle away at the, the value that you can provide because it's about getting it into this construct that fits the way that it can be promoted instead of fitting the narrative that you're trying to, um, to provide for people or the insight that you're trying to provide for people. Well, I think it's, it's, it's both, right. You know, like you can't have one without the other. And unfortunately, and fortunately what we're doing is still show business in a way, you know, this is still a form of entertainment. And so therefore it is show business. And there's also a business side of it. Um, you know, it's like, if you talk to someone who does porn full time or is a sex worker full time, it's like, Oh, you know, don't you ever, just get like, you know, you're not into the person, blah, blah, blah. It's like, it's a job. It's my job. I go to work. I do my job, you know, like, and yes, there are good days and bad days. Everyone feels that way, but it's no different, you know, and, and there is a business behind the show and the fun part is the show. Yeah. But then you also have to do the business part. <laughs> I mean, can somebody However, else do I, the business part? <laughs> I, yes, you can pay other people to do business parts. <laughs> when I can, I will. That's what I will when say. When you can, you will. But there's, but it's also just, it's also being, and we can talk about this more off off camera. But like, it's also being more like Taylor Swift, really, when it comes down to marketing. If you look at her social media when she's not doing a launch of an album or something she's not on there yeah she's not on there she just doesn't live her life on social media like the rest of us and she doesn't have to yeah because she has a huge very expensive machine machine behind her however there are many lessons to be learned about that because you too also do not have to live on social media if what you're creating is impactful and specific and resonating with the people who are paying attention and yeah. then getting them to pay attention is really up to your reach. And I don't mean reach like how many people and followers do you have? I mean, how how far are you willing to reach? Mm. And sometimes yeah, that okay. takes money. And sometimes that takes, you know, sucking it up and being like, okay, we're going to write the check. It's And we're going to see what happens. Yeah. Well, I, the, the, the waiting part of the game is so challenging because even if you're putting Ugh, your heart yeah. soul and energy into it um it doesn't mean the results are immediate and that i think is to be expected but it also is super draining sometimes and like when we were starting to chat before we really dove into the conversation it's like it's exhausting to keep pushing forward without a clear understanding of what comes next or even what you want. Like, I don't know that, like, I can tell you that I, I've always said, you know, I just want somebody to pay me to talk for a living. Like, that's great. But what does that look like in the longer term? What does that look like five years from now, 10 years from now, or not even in the span of years? What does that look like? Let's say I get that, you know, the studio show and I can sit there and I can talk to people for a couple of hours. Okay. Like what, what does that mean? What am I trying to do with that? It's not just about sitting there and talking to somebody. It's about the impact, like you said, that that has. And I think what we're both striving for from what you're saying about writing your book and and trying to adapt that for a show is that it's like we want the message to proliferate and to be able to continue to drive people to see opportunities in front of them from what content is being created. And I think that's a really beautiful thing that is part of like being in show business, being a creator, but it's like the in-between is the less glamorous. And, and that's the part that I find personally hardest to navigate. 
Well, and that's also something that social media has ruined because we don't see the in-between. You know, someone puts up a post and in our minds, we're like, oh, they just took that photo and they uploaded it. And maybe they did, but that isn't true 100% of the time. Like, how many times do I have a photo shoot and like six months later, I put the photos up because like, you know, I didn't have them or I wasn't ready to put them out there or what I shot them for wasn't here yet. Yeah. And, you know, I th- I think to your point of, of the long-term versus the short-term, when I had, when I got my book published, my goal was never to sell books. Like I knew it was going to happen and I want people to buy it and please go buy my book and love it. But like the goal was never, oh my God, I'm selling a million books a week. I love this. Like that was never my intention. If it happened, wonderful. But the publishing of the book was to get the press, to get the conversation going about the adaptation for the TV show so that we then, when we get to that point, we can say, and look at what we've already been doing. Yes. Yeah. And give us money to produce it because it is about the long game. Yeah. You know, like th- this podcast right now, it like it can't be about the metrics that you're seeing on the back end. And it can't be about the tomorrow I have to edit this. And next week I'm interviewing this person. Next month it's this. It's like these episodes are bricks that you are laying to build the bigger house when you can be gay Oprah or Oprah. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> I love it. Um, but, you, but you know what I mean? Like you have to see your short term as smaller pieces of the long term. Yes. Yeah, totally. And to. I, I love that you said that too. And especially around the publication of your book and having that as, of course, you want people to buy it. You wrote the story. It's important to you. The, the goal of writing a book is not that people don't read it. You want people to read it. But I think the... Um, I was listening to something the other day where um, I think it was Brendan Burchard and he was saying, you know, when he became a writer, he was like, I don't want to just hand over a book to get a million copies sold and Barnes and Noble is reaping the benefits of that. And I don't get to connect with the people who are reading my book. Right. It's like you want to know that what you're doing makes an impact, but that you also have some influence on that impact, that it's not just, look, I've sold a million copies of this book, but I don't see what's happening as a result of that. And it's not just the, because it's not about just the financial benefit of that. It's about the personal impact because you did it for a reason. Yes. And it's also about, again, the strategy of it all. And you are right. Like, yes, you don't publish a book or you don't write a book for people not to read it. But the just like any kind of content that you create, the metrics of it cannot be the reason you do it. Yeah, absolutely. And it cannot be the expectation and you cannot put your your worth in those numbers. It's hard though. Of course it's hard because it's it's a gold star. It's dopamine. It's like yeah. it's like you did a good job at those million views on the thing. Like it feels good. But it cannot be the be all end all. It has you have to look at it as a piece of the thing that you're working towards. Just like Matt Damon's Oscar at 25 and having that realization of like, oh shit, this means nothing. Yeah. And I don't mean it means nothing, but it means nothing in the grand scheme of things. It is a piece of his puzzle. Yes. That he then could use to roll forward and do more and do more and do more, whether it be as an actor or producer or writer or showrunner or whatever, whatever trajectory trajectory he wanted to take. Yeah. You know, and so for us who are digital creators who are creating content outside of the digital space, whatever you want to call it the thing that you're creating now cannot be the be all end all. It has to be a a piece of a bigger picture that you have an understanding of. And that's why I say Taylor Swift, because when she's doing album launches, she could just be like, Hey, I'm releasing an album, but she doesn't. She breaks it down. She takes the full album and she breaks it down to these tiny little, I'm going to post a picture of a clock and let you guys figure it out. And let you have fever dreams about what she's about to do. Because that's what that's what her fan base does. That's what they're trained to do now. And yeah. might we all be so lucky to have such a fan, <laughs> a right? fan base that does that. That's like, well, they wore purple on Tuesday with a white manicure. And that's the same color as this. It's like, God, could we all can we all be that smart to figure out how to do that? But that's in the in general, generally speaking, like that's what it is. It's taking the big picture realizing that what you're doing right now is not the big picture. It's the smaller pieces that make the big picture. Coming back to what you said earlier about having a support system in moments like this as well, where we're trying to navigate these other parts of our lives, especially something when we're pursuing our purposes, like 
be willing to solicit the help and the feedback from other people. And that's something that like I struggle with. I think a lot of people do. One of our best friends came over and was saying, you know, I needed help. And I, you know, normally I feel bad asking for it, but I was like, no, this is good. And then we also get a chance to hang out. We're a group of close friends who are all entrepreneurs. And so it's like, we might not be doing the same things, but we understand the struggle and we understand the desire to create something meaningful. And so It's like if you can build a community of people around you who can offer you advice or give you an ear when you need somebody to listen or give you tough love when you need somebody to tell you what's like actually up, then allow yourself to be open and vulnerable to create the space for those conversations because it's so easy to just be in our own head about it. And to me, it's similar with like the idea of paying too close of attention to the metrics is like... We, it's the story we tell ourselves outside of the numbers too, right? Like I, I've i struggled with this. I still have moments where I'm like, why does my voice matter? Why is it, why is somebody going to listen to what I have to say versus what somebody else is already saying out there? And then the the whole idea of like comparison is the thief of joy, right? Like it is, we sit here and we minimize ourselves because we don't understand that like we're laying those bricks and then that, and that, building is, is coming to fruition. It's so hard to zoom out and see it when you're in there looking at this specific brick and where you're going to place it. Well, I also think that, you know, not to get, not to harp on the architecture, uh, analogy (laughs) of, 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 of building bricks and things, but like when it comes to this kind of thing, I don't, I truly believe that there is no wrong answer. It's figuring out what you want to do. And really, it's you making a decision. And that's where a lot of people, myself included, get stuck. You know, I, I think um, I I tend to look back and be like, oh, God, I wish I would have done that sooner. Oh, I wish I would have done that there. I should have done this here. And shooting yourself is never good. Yeah. But it's smart. I think it's helpful to look at from at least a discerning place of saying, okay, I see now in hindsight where this would have fit better, but it's happening now and that's all that matters. Yeah. So like, so like, yes, comparison is the thief of joy, but let's turn that around and say, you have a podcast and someone else has a podcast. Why should you have a podcast and not them? Well, why shouldn't you? Yeah. You're not going to say the same thing that they're going to say. And this again comes back to the idea of putting the word influencer in our mouths with a bad taste. Like that, that's just what we are. If you're showing up online, if you're showing up on social media, guess what? You're an influencer because you're talking to people who follow you and you're telling them the things that you want to offer and value. That's being an influencer. Well, because it's offering influence, right? You're an influential exactly. person. You're literally, <laughs> that's literally what you're doing. And I think that just because there's a negative connotation around it based on the early aughts when they were new with things like YouTube and Vine and everything else, you know, like that, we just have a bad association with it. Yeah. But that's what we're doing. You know, like anyone who's showing up online, like you're influencing, like people have had different names for it. Fucking coach, fucking other, like you're an influencer. Okay. So like behave like one and that's where the money comes from playing to that and being like, I'm not an influencer. I'm, I'm a helper. Like, shut up, shut up. You're an influencer. Turn on your fucking camera and talk to it and treat yourself like an influencer because you know who is not higher, you know, who's not getting brand deals, helpers, influencers are getting brand deals. So if you want one, go be one. There's the tough love I needed. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) But it is, it's hard because even, even, even me who is saying this, I have a hard time being like, just pick up your fucking camera, you dumb bitch. Like, just go. Like, you're not an influencer. Yes, you are. Like, it's okay to say the word. It's okay to give yourself permission to do that. You know, it's, I think it's going to be at some point, at some point, we're going to get, get, we're going to arrive at a place where someone can say without the entire room cringing that they're an influencer. Right. And not have everyone be like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> or like just immediately discredit them as a human being. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I get because, like, because. It truly is like, I hate to break it to you, but if you have a camera and a microphone and you're showing up online, like you're influencing, whether you yes. have a million followers or a hundred, it doesn't matter. You're influencing. Yeah. I, well, cause I think the thing that you're pointing out too, is also that people sort of take the viability out of what it means to be an influencer. It's like, you think of somebody who's an Instagram model and the like very catered aesthetic photos that showed up years ago when that's like, oh, they're an influencer, they're an influencer. What 
we're talking about is having the power to influence people. And to me, I think it's like influence is the most valuable currency that we have. It's the thing that we can use the most to our advantage, unfortunately, for better and for worse, right? Like politically speaking, it is a problem, Um, but it also is a good thing. Like that's how you there's two sides to it. And I I think that while, as you pointed out, and I, I love that you did point this out, that it sort of left this sour taste in our mouth that we feel like there's some stigma associated with being an influencer. It means you're not credible or you're not valid while somehow simultaneously being credited and accredited and validated by your followers. It's like, it's, we, it's like we are unwilling to acknowledge that there can be a a duality to it. Like that there's actually, yes, there can be influencers who are not really adding a ton of meaningful value, but they're still influencing people. And then there can be influencers who are adding a lot of meaningful value. And I think we're the only people who can decide what that looks like. And if we believe that there's meaning in it, then we should pursue that. And I'm like you, it's like, just pick up your phone or put on the camera and just say it, just go in and say it. And I will talk constantly about how I'm like, I will do this all day with you. I will do this all day with anybody. I love to talk. And it's like, but try and shut me up. I dare you. (laughs) Right. But why can I not just turn my camera on and talk to it? It's because I don't feel like I have the relationship that's required for me to feel like my perspective is being, um, I don't even want to say validated because that's not right. But it's like, I struggle with like speaking to a camera versus actually having the interaction with somebody. Well, I I think there's two things I kind of want to say about this. One is that I think we need to look at this from the perspective of like, being an influencer is having a job. Like you are paid in some capacity to do that eventually. Um, and there are the pretty pictures in perfect places and their lives are perfect influencers. And then there's the sitting in your car crying influencer, you know, and everyone in between. But that is also true with every other job. There are good professors. There are bad professors. There are great doctors. There are not so great doctors. There are good teachers. There are bad teachers. And there are good influencers and bad influencers or whatever you want. And like maybe good, bad, different, I, like whatever you want to put, yeah, put there's variety. whatever label you want to put on that. Right. There's a variety of it. And so kind of stepping away and being like, I'm not this like. I'm in Mykonos every other weekend on a yacht influencer. Maybe I'm not the crying in the car influencer, but like uh, there's a place for me here somewhere. Um, I'm in my car in Mykonos crying. (laughs) (laughs) What a Venn diagram. (laughs) Like (laughs) Doing mukbang videos in the back car. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But like, you know, I mean, it's just kind of uh, coming to, coming to terms and coming to peace with that label, I think for one. And then for two, I mean, to your point about the camera, I talk about this a lot and I think it's so fascinating because I love history and I love facts and and science and numbers, but there was a um, two-part study, one that was done in the early part of the 1920s during the industrial industrial revolution. And then it was revisited later in the 1950s where it, be, where it got its name, uh, which was the, um, oh my God, it was the, um, I'll think of it. Anyway, it's basically um, factory workers in the 1920s. They wanted to experiment to see if they behaved and or worked differently if they thought that they were being watched. And so they would turn lights on. They would put like spotlights on them to like make it feel like they were being watched. And sure enough, they were more productive. They behaved differently. They weren't, didn't act out as much. They didn't speak to the people around them. And then later on, it was revisited and restudied and it was given a name. And God damn it, I can't remember what it's called. But we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. I'm going to Google it right now. Hang on. <laughs> um, do people behave differently when they're being watched? Study 1920s. Hawthorne effect. There we go. It's the Hawthorne effect. I knew I'd remember. I, oh, I so love mad. that this just happened because I also appreciate that you Google things the way that I would. 
<laughs> of course. <laughs> Whatever information I have that I can source from this, this is what we're putting into the Google right. search. Well, that's, that's what Google's for. It figures it out for you. You're, as long as you're somewhere on the spectrum, it's good. I'm so much uh, smarter but, because of it. <laughs> same. <laughs> but the Hawthorne effect is what I'm talking about. And it's, it's the same idea as applied to doing something like this. When a camera turns on and you know that you're recording, your brain does something different. And yes. you, you become different. And it takes, you know, you think of actors and you're like, you see actors and you're like, oh, that's so easy. But then you get on set and a camera's on you and you're like, dur, 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 because something happens when you know you're being watched. Mm. It's the same thing for doing this kind of thing. When you want to sit down and you want to offer all this advice, but the second you hit record, all of a sudden you have nothing to say. I literally just said this the other day. So there's a camera in my face right now. Obviously, we're looking at each other via right. the screen. <laughs> yes. But that's not my focal point, right? And right. so even though I know people will be watching this or listening to it, my thought is about the conversation that you and I are having right now. When it is me and the camera, I go right into that. Do I have no thoughts or opinions anymore? Because 99.9% .9 of my day, I have so many <laughs> thoughts and opinions and now there are none. And then I try yeah. to articulate it and it feels forced. It feels like even if I'm saying the things that I'm thinking that are genuine, it's not being delivered in a way that feels authentic because for me, having somebody on the receiving end of the conversation is what allows me to feel so connected to it. Well, I think, you know, back to our, our conversation earlier, this might be mitigated by just like having the thought in real time and recording it on your phone and saving it for later and yeah. then editing it all together and doing it more like a vlog instead of like a sit down keynote talk, you yes. know, like because because th the thing is, too, and I think we forget this is that when we see people online who are speaking for 20 minutes at a time into a camera, they've prepared that. Yeah. Well, yeah, sure. like, that's not just that's not just like I'm going to sit down today and hit record and see what happens. And I'm going to speak eloquently and perfectly for 20 minutes. Like unless it's edited, they didn't do that. Right. Like <laughs> they took notes, they made an outline, they figured out what they were going to talk about. Even people at the highest level of expertise do that because it, it's just not because of the Hawthorne effect. Like, yes, you might be able to have a conversation with someone on the street for 30 minutes about a particular topic. But the second a camera comes out, you know that there are stakes attached. Yeah. Yeah. Bye bye brain. <laughs> it's like brain on the street, completely done. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, and the way that you you said that it also just made me think about how when I do interact with people in a very organic way when there's no cameras involved, I I feel so at ease, engaged, capable of having those conversations, tapping into all of these thoughts and and this knowledge that I have. And it's just without hesitation. And then as soon as you get into a place where you realize that there's more perceived pressure, because it's like the external factors that we allow to contribute to our understanding of who's going to see it or what the perception is going to be. It's like everything just sort of falls out of your head and you're left with this feeling of like, well, do I even know what I'm talking about? And I feel like it just, it, it perpetuates self-doubt unnecessarily. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, and yeah, it's, <laughs> we're all like humans, humans in our brains are such funny little things, you know, like we, we want I think it's so easy to say like that you have a clear picture of something in front of you, but then to actually get your brain to go and do it is a totally different thing. Like I wake up in the morning and I have these fantasies of the runs that I go on and workouts that I do. And I don't leave my apartment because I'm so like, okay, that's nice. Can I lose weight by just thinking about running? Is yes. that something I could do? Does the science <laughs> exist to back that? I would appreciate it. <laughs> I would appreciate that so much, but like, but it really is. It, it's just, it's, so, you know, again, but it's getting out of our own way. You know, yeah. it's just recognizing the fact that we're doing it and then stopping ourselves from stopping ourselves. Really? Yes. Oh my gosh. It, it's like the most timely conversation at this point, because I've been saying that on repeat, probably on a daily basis with the way that I am just currently in my own head lately and wanting to get out of my own way and knowing that it is that discomfort of actually having to take the next step, even though the result that I want is on the other side of that next step or a few other next steps, right? You're like, I don't want to keep living life in the capacity that I'm living in now. I have a good life. I'm happy. I appreciate a lot of things here. But I also feel like I'm meant for more and I feel like I'm capable of 
helping people more. And for me to do that, it's not serving anybody for me to sit here and wish that I were doing more. I need to actually go try to do more or do do differently because it's not always more. It's do something differently um, and approach yeah. it differently and be open minded to approaching it differently. Like I grapple so much with what's the right next thing to do. And it's like, sometimes you just have to feel that out and let yourself kind of wander in those thoughts of like, well, would this work? Would that work? And I think sometimes we're just so eager to get an answer that we lose sight of the exploration to find the answer. Well, and again, I think depending on what you're talking about, there is no answer. The answer is what you decide. You know, like there's, there are, there are certain points in my life where I think about what would happen had I not done that or done it differently. My biggest example is I had a very cushy apartment situation um, in the Upper West Side of of New York that I was in for 10 years. And I just got to a point where it was like, I need to get out of here. And I had this big job and I had a big influx of money and I was like, peace, I'm moving. And that's where I'm at now. You're seeing the apartment that I moved into after that. Um, But I still think about sometimes like, what if I hadn't left? How would my life be different? And certainly you and I would not be sitting here speaking because I, with that move, required more money and was seeking out different kinds of jobs. And because of those jobs, I landed in the industries that I landed in, which got me to publish my book, which got me a publicist, which got me to do all these different things. And here we are. So like thinking about maybe I shouldn't have moved certainly is a thing that crosses my mind. But the current life that I have now that I wouldn't really trade because I like where it's going doesn't exist yeah and then also you know last year i um last year right around this time i lost a very big job that it was very that meant a lot to me and it was i was blindsided by the whole thing it came absolutely out of nowhere and i was not okay and i could have done what i would have what i think i normally would have done which is just like pack my things and come back home and you know, drink for a while and then get back on the horse and figure it out. But instead, I was like, fuck this. And I cashed in all of my credit card points and I took my ass to Europe for three weeks. And I had the time of my life. And this time of year now reminds me of that instead of losing the job. And there is a world where I could have just like thrown my hands up and came back to New York and and who knows what would have happened then. Mm-hmm. You know, like a different version, a different version of blowing my life up. But neither of those scenarios in either of those situations is a right or wrong answer. It's just different. Yes. So approaching something where you're like, I don't know what to do. It's like, it doesn't matter. Just do something. Yeah. <laughs> because then if you don't, because if you don't like the outcome, you can always go back and do something else. Right. You know, like, and and that's quote unquote, not working, but you learned something. Yeah. And so therefore it was working anyway. Totally. It's so funny how sometimes it's kind of like in therapy where I'll be talking and then about midway through what I'm saying, I'm like, oh, that's really what I needed to understand. But it's with other people on the podcast where I'm like, you're saying things to me that I say to other people. Why is it so hard for me to receive that? Like, why is it so challenging? But I mean, same. Just, I do the like, same thing. Duh, I say okay. shit to people, but I'm like, I'm. I should take my own advice on that mm. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what do you think is it that keeps you from taking your own advice in those moments? Um, I think not necessarily specific to me, but I think in general, it's ego. We let our egos get in the way and be yeah. like, "You don't need to do that. <laughs> That's not <Yeah>. for you." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> snicker, snicker, snicker. Right. Um. But I think for me, it's, it's, I think a lot of it is a combination of some form of fear and another form of paralysis. Mm. You know, like I have these very strange from working at home for over a year, I have these very strange attachments to my desk and my computer where I feel like if I'm not sitting at them, I'm not being a good boy and I'm not making money. And so anytime I go outside, it's like, you're missing out, you're losing, you're losing out, you're fucking up, get back home. And so even like leaving my house to go to the gym during that period of time was really stressful because it was like, no, 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 I need to be home. Even though everything I did is on my phone and I could just like access it there. There's something, there's some psychological tie that I have to sitting at my desk and getting things done that to me equals making money. Yeah, well, it's kind of the toxic productivity mindset of like, if if you're doing something that isn't distinctly that task that's going to drive towards income, that like, it's not productive. 
And it's like, that's not true because self-care is productive. It prevents burnout, right? Like in a lot of ways, what you were just mentioning about feeling tied to your desk. My wife is an entrepreneur. She's had her own business for 12 years. And I said to her recently, I was like, you need to make time to come out of your hole. You can't just like wake up in the morning, go down, do your work, come back up for dinner, then eat dinner and then keep working until you go to bed. Like you're, it's not sustainable. And while you think that it's productive and it's giving you these results that you want, like you're compromising the other areas of your life where you need to find balance. And I think a lot of it too, because I agree with you, I think fear and ego are super relevant for me in terms of like what prevents me from taking my own advice or, or or taking the action that I need to take. But it's also like you said that comfort with, with the idea that if we do it this way, that's going to warrant the result that we want instead of recognizing that some of those other things are also key factors in getting that result. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's also realizing that everyone is different. Everyone's, you know, way to where they want to go is different. There is no formula. There is no secret weapon that is just going to like automatically. That's one of the things that pissed me off about coaching world. It's like, if you do this, you will make this amount of money. And like, no one was doing, they, they were all doing the thing, but no one was making the money. So it's just like, stop listening to other people, learn the skills you need to learn the hard skills. Yeah. Like the do, the do, I can sit down on my computer and do this. Yes. And then everything that goes into it, that's what you have to figure out and make decisions on on your own. No one can teach you that. You can't buy that from someone. Right. They can talk you through it. We can have a conversation like this and we can, we can brainstorm and consult on it all we want. Yeah. But unless you have the hard skills, the other shit doesn't matter. Yeah. And you're totally. throwing your money away at someone who's regurgitating something from someone that they learned who regurgitated it from someone else from someone else they learned who regurgitated it and so on and so forth. And it's all just the same stale information. And what the missing piece is, is what do you want to do right now? What feels best for you moving forward? Yeah. If you want to, if you want to create this big like media company where you are sitting down hosting talk shows and having podcasts and making appearances and hosting things and doing this that, and the next thing, okay. What do you need to do to get there? If you don't know, choose something or yeah. work backwards. You know, if yeah. you want to have a TV show, who do you know that works in television? Who do you know that has produced something on TV before? Who do you know that works in news? You know, like like figure that out and go yeah. backwards. Well, leverage your leverage because- your network. And I think part of it is the discomfort of feeling like you're taking advantage of those connections that you have sometimes. And I know that it's necessary, right? And I that the reason I say it out loud is because I know that it I have people in my life who are willfully supportive and all it takes is me to ask for that support and I can get it. And it's that part of my ego being like, I don't want somebody to think I'm taking advantage of the relationship that I have with them, right? I don't want somebody to feel like I'm only connecting with them because it's been a while and now I have a need. And I think it's easy to feel shame around that, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. And so what you're saying is totally valid. And I agree with you completely. I definitely, it's one of those ways that I get in my own way. And we all do it because we, and I, and the idea that like we were all born creative geniuses and then it was beaten out of us, I think is also something uh, where we, we learn hesitation and we learn fear in moving forward. Mm. And that comes from not fitting in, from being bullied, from being picked on, from, you know, being othered in school in some way, you know, we, we learn that if we are other and if we are different, then we don't fit in. And when you're in a communal herd mentality like that, not fitting in is death. Oh yeah. Unless unless you figure out a way to be the leader of the pack. But it's like I also and don't like, want to be the leader of the pack. Well, not that pack. <laughs> 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 but I mean it's it's a survival thing that I think it has a place in in um what we're talking about in the sense that like you know, I I won't go into the whole detail of it all, but like when I was 16, I was forced to come out at school. And this was at a small private Catholic school that I did not fit in at. Um, I tried to play sports. I tried to, and like, and I tried to balance that with like doing things that I wanted to do, like band and choir and shows and everything else. And it wasn't until I came out that people stopped making fun of me because they knew they had nothing on me. That was the only thing they ever made fun of me for. And now it was on the table and it was like, yeah, fuck you. What are you going to do? 
And I was a nightmare for that school for two years because it was like, stop me. What are you going to do? I love that. And, and that was me becoming the leader of the pack, quote unquote, as a survival mechanism. I didn't want to be a leader of that fucking pack. Like, Ask me who I talked to from high school. Literally like one person and that's it. <laughs> well, it reminds me of, it reminds me of um a clip I saw of Brene Brown the other day that was like fitting in is the opposite of belonging. Like fitting in is yeah. what we do when we're trying to be something that we feel will, will gain acceptance from being, but belonging is the acceptance of yourself and that being able to show up authentically and know that you're still accepted for who you are. And I grappled much like you just said, like with fitting in and I had groups of friends and I, I felt like, you know, I, I did the sports and I, you know, I can connect with people well. So I had these relationships that I think, you know, at points in time served their purpose and they were meaningful, but it was like my entire life because I didn't come out in high school. It was like the amount of work that I've done in therapy to figure out like why I'm so insecure. It's like, I mean, at this point it feels textbook, but it's like, you're going on that journey to navigate like these preconceived notions that you have about yourself that have been ingrained in us from those experiences. And then trying to unwind that to get to a place where it's like, you have the confidence and you understand that you have the capability now through your experiences, whether that's hard or soft skills to be able to deliver on that value you want to deliver. But again, it's like, you have to forget what everybody else thinks about you to do it. And it's so much easier said than done. So much easier said than done. And, and to that point, it's also, I've always been kind of contrarian in the sense that like when everyone else was reading Harry Potter, I was not, I wanted nothing to do with it. Same Same with Twilight, same with anything else. I was like, you idiots. (laughs) 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 And like, do I wish that I would have gotten into it? Maybe, but like, you know, the point more so is if everyone else is doing it, maybe don't. Yeah. You know, um, and, and that's like, again, it's the fitting in the wanting to be part of the pack. That's the survival thing. And that's something that we've learned from the time we were children, you know, especially if you went to a, a public school or a, a school where there was a homogeny of people, you know, if you weren't them, you weren't the popular kids or you weren't someone who could easily navigate throughout the day without being shoved into a locker, you know, like, like, great. <laughs> um, And that will serve you, that served you later in life, probably, I'm guessing, because it's that thing, it's that, it's that fucking saying that everyone says, it's like the thing that makes you strange is the thing that is what makes you great or what, I don't know yeah, what it like actually it's, is, it's but your, it's, 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 it's special, right? Like it's the thing that gives you, it differentiates you. And I think we are learning to value more and more that differentiation. And and to the point as like, we're kind of rounding out the conversation, I think about how it's goes back to what you were saying about if you're an influencer, it's like, be who you are, be who you are and show up the way that feels right to you. Because if you keep doing that, you're going to grasp the attention of people who are interested in that. And if you are trying to be something that you're not, it's not sustainable. You're gonna have to keep playing that long game without being able to show up fully. And the people that you're accruing as a following aren't going to understand what it looks like to to actually be part of the message that you want to share or who you actually are. So I'm really glad that you said this. (laughs) Am I? (laughs) Um, I don't know, maybe. So I always think about, I'm I'm like such a pop culture nerd, right? So like, I always think about like early 2000s, Jennifer Lopez, when there were like all these rumors swirling around about how like her ass was insured for a million dollars and she had someone walking in front of her spraying the air so she didn't have to smell the same oxygen that the common people were smelling. And then they came out with the whole like, Jenny from the block, I'm real album. Where it was just like, Jenny's just like you, she's from the Bronx. And it's like, bitch, no, she ain't. But that was a marketing ploy. And I, and this is something I, I will, I talk about a lot where it's like the authenticity thing that everyone is pushing is bullshit. You decide the version of you that's coming to the camera today. You know, look at, look at Billie Eilish. She shows up with green and black hair and two seconds later, she's in a Marilyn Monroe dress. You know, like Lady Gaga shows up as like this fame monster alien and two seconds later she looks like an alien and then next thing we know she's singing with Tony Bennett. You know, like like these are all intentionally decided and crafted marketing material plans 
to decide the version of authenticity that they want to put out in the world. And like, no one is truly like, I'm not going to turn on a camera and be laying on the couch, like with a bourbon in my hand, watching TV. That's not the version of me you're getting, but that I could argue is my most true authentic self. (laughs) But like, because of what we talked about with the Hawthorne effect, no one's going to show up on camera like that really, especially if they have an agenda, like being an entrepreneur online. And so like the idea of being your authentic self, you get to decide what that even is. Well, it's like, it's there. I would say there's like layers of who we are. Right. And that there's a, I think it were, it's possible for us to show up authentically in various ways. And like you're saying, of course, because we're not all just one thing. Right. And so I'm not going to like flip my camera on when it's like that low angle and it accidentally like snaps a photo and you're like, that's great. I'm going to put that on the internet for people to see that. like, <laughs> I was like, this isn't good. I, nobody needs to see that. Nobody needs to know that's what my face looks like right now. Um, but I don't think that it takes away from people's authenticity to also try different things. Like you're talking about like broader pop culture market marketing techniques. And I, and I get that. So I, I think that that's sort of its own realm. But then I also think about, I've put out different content and been like, okay, I'm going to change the way I edit this, or I'm going to change the way I do this. And it's like, you're, some of it is trial and error to figure out what even feels right to you. And how do you even know what's authentic to you if you're not trying things and and navigating that journey to be like, okay, well, when I do this this way, it doesn't feel right to me. Okay, if that's not con- in congruence with who you are, then try the next thing that feels closer to that. And giving yourself a chance to be able to explore those things without a sense of inauthenticity, I think is also important. Yeah, but I also like on a on a pop culture spectrum of things, I don't think it's that different. It's just on a smaller scale. You know, what you're talking about with like the trial and error and blah, blah, blah. Like how many times, how many wigs did Gaga try on before she decided on like the flat blonde bang? Yeah. You know, like like how many versions of that exist? How many how many different outfits did she try on? How many different sunglasses did she try on before they got the fame album cover? You know, like it's 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 just that trial and error is the behind the scenes stuff that we don't see or maybe we don't pick up on mm. um i <laughs> my best friend does stand up and a, a bunch of years ago i was at the gotham comedy club for like an open openish mic night thing that he was doing and jerry seinfeld showed up and he did a set and his set was him with a legal pad trying out new material and most of it was fucking awful it was not good and uh like really abhorrently bad <laughs> but like that supremely was, disappointing <laughs> right but like that was his trial and error he went to gotham comedy club on 23rd street where there's 25 people in the audience and he showed up and everyone's excited to see him and he fucking bombed and it doesn't matter because no one ever tur- no one will ever see that light of day of that and that is our version of what we're talking about with trial and error yeah that was his trial and error the yeah. trial and error of different pop stars maybe we don't see that yeah. But, it, but yes. our trial and error is more micro because we're creating content as a trial and error to see what works. And so yeah. that becomes public facing. That becomes something that gets posted and, and people view it and see it. And then we get to decide what works, what doesn't, what we like, what we don't. Yeah. As much as we kind of know what can work, you follow the algorithm, you do these things, whatever, like you said at the beginning, there's this part of it where it's like you also have to do something that feels like relevant to your message or the type of creativity that you want to explore. Like my wife and I have so many ideas about things that we want to do. We've created some really honestly kind of dumb videos that have gotten way more traction than things that we wish could have gotten more. And you're like, so some people are interested in these stupid things that we're creating and other people are interested in the like more sociopolitical commentary that we have about certain things. And it's like, it doesn't mean that we're not being authentic in both of those scenarios. Cause one of them's like our playful, fun, authentic side. And the other is our like socially engaged and aware side that is right, trying but to. This is like, what we were talking about with being an influencer. Yeah. It's not just turn on the camera and talk about political, so, like sociopolitical stuff. You can do that. Sure. But that's not who you are a hundred percent of the time. And that's not who you are in totality. So like, being able to be silly and goofy and stupid in one video and sociopolitical in another and maybe talk about the economy or the labor movement or strikes or whatever have you. Like, if you go to my TikTok right now, there is no video back-to-back that is the same. 
like the last one I did, I was talking about how Joey Fatone is the hot one. And don't fight me. I'll kill you. <laughs> he always Well, has I fun. know where I'm but going like, after this conversation ends. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there's not a whole lot of through line because it's just what I was thinking in the moment and what I wanted to put together. And like sometimes I have those thoughts in the moment and I save them to drafts and I post them later. But it's not like it's it's I I take my the the foot of my agenda off the neck of my social media mm. and i just kind of like let whatever i want to say happen and if people because th- think think about how you use let's use tiktok specifically you're scrolling through tiktok and you find somebody and you like what they have to say let's say they have a part one part two whatever yeah when that's over you probably are going to go to their profile to see what else they have yeah And if they're amusing, then you follow them. If you really like them, maybe you'll click the link on their bio. And by just creating that one piece of something that attracted you to like go to their profile and look at more, you've already given them more metrics than they would have otherwise because they did something different. Now, maybe all their content is the same. Fine. If that's what you want to consume, cool. But you're still there. Yeah. You still made it over. Well, you're proving that they influenced you in some way. Exactly. And so again, it comes back to like the stop, like, let's stop all being assholes about pretending we're not influencers. (laughs) And just let the influence flow through you, right? Like let the influence flow through you. (laughs) Influence yourself that you are an influencer that influences others. (laughs) (laughs) Because it really is just like, like you you said it some stuff is goofy some stuff is more serious and that that continue to do that grayscale because it's not black and white every like things that are a monolithic get boring after a while and so like just allow some color to come in because everyone is going to like a different color but if they're yeah. all going to the same crayon box and it's your crayon box you've won I love that. I feel like that's such a great way to wrap things up here, Edward. This has been such a great <laughs> conversation. I, I'm so glad we finally got to do this. And I feel like we could do this for so many more hours. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I almost feel like it's important that I have a hard stop because if I didn't, this would be the rest of my night. And then I'd be like, now we have not been productive. Um, no, right. that's not true. And I have that's not true. This I need is, to go to bed. <laughs> this is productive. It's just not um, the thing that I need to do to get my episode out tomorrow. And so to your point, it's like, you know, it's, it's finding those opportunities, seizing them, being grateful for them as they're coming up and being able to say that this was something, this is, I'm going to bring it back to the analogy real quick. This is one of those bricks that's being laid that is going to help create more opportunity, ideally in both of our lives. But if nothing else, the fact that we were able to meet and create this connection and have this conversation in a very honest way that also, you know, having this dialogue with you and being able to hear your perspective while you're also in, you're invoking questions or challenging certain things that I may say, like, I really appreciate that because I think a lot of times what can happen in a show is First of all, this is not the standard Q&A interview type thing that I'm trying to do anyway, but you really went to a place of and committing to what your perspective is, but also having like free flowing thoughts around it. And I feel like that's just the ideal interview, like bring it to the place that feels right for you in the moment. And I'm just so glad that we had a chance to do that. I am too, and I hope we can do it again soon. Yes, please. <laughs> and not wait another six months before we can do it again. Oh my gosh, I absolutely agree. And um, in the meantime, I know that your book is available uh, wherever they're sold pretty much, right? Cancer, Musical Theater, and Other Chronic Illnesses by Edward Miskey. But also, is there anywhere else you want people to follow you? I don't think I know your TikTok right off the top of my head. It's everything is just my name. I tried to keep the continuity going. So it's just at Edward Miskey on all platforms. Perfect. Well, gang, that's all for this episode of Who the Fuck. Be sure to give Edward a follow wherever you are on social media. He is an influencer and proud of it. So (laughs) we will catch you on the flip side. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks for listening to Who the Fuck. And if you like what you hear, share the show with your friends, family, coworkers, or anyone else you think needs a healthy dose of introspection and raw authenticity. Feel free to rate and review wherever you get your podcasts. It's always appreciated. And you can also visit whothefck.com to keep up to date with what's new in my world and for exclusive bonus content. 